Welcome to Growing, a podcast about birth, babies, and beyond. I'm your host, Beth. I'm a midwife, a business owner, and a mum. If you're anything like me, you find yourself wearing many hats, and this can be fun and hard and everything in between. So I'm here to offer support and solidarity for whatever season of growth you find yourself in. Let's go. Hello and welcome to Growing. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Leonie. Leonie is a mom of two toddler boys. She is the host and founder of the Parenthood Podcast, where parents call in with confessions of what is keeping them up at night. And Leonie explores these topics and provides unsolicited advice. The podcast explores all topics from sexless marriages to surviving affairs and overcoming the daily resentment that can build up in relationships. Leonie is also a relationship coach, property developer, part-time model, and is very well-versed in juggling it all. I am so honored to have Leonie on the pod today, and with her impressive resume and skill set, we honestly could have discussed anything, but today Leonie joins us as a relationship coach to discuss hot topics around relationships and parenthood. Welcome, Leonie. Thank you so much, Beth. It's so good to be here. Now, I, like I said, we honestly could have talked about anything, particularly what resonated with me when we connected was the fact that you do juggle a lot. I think that's something that I navigate on the daily as well. But I immediately was drawn to picking your brain about relationships because it is such a big and complex challenge that people and couples face when they move into parenthood. Mm -hmm. So what I actually did was I put it out to my Instagram community. I said, what do you want to know? (laughs) And I was overwhelmed with many, many responses. And so we're going to kind of work through some of those topics today. Love that. Now, it won't surprise you, but absolutely the biggest topic that popped up was this idea of the mental load. Mm -hmm. How can I get my partner to see it? to understand it. And something that I noticed popped up a lot in the questions was this theme of how can I share my mental load without minimizing theirs or without sounding like I am complaining or or minimizing the stress of being, you know, not the primary carer or not the parent in the home. So I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a big topic and one that we've explored in our podcast too. So I feel like it was brought up on the ABC podcast uh, last year on Ladies We Need to Talk. And I think from there, there was just this explosion from everyone like, yes, that's what it is. We've given it a name now. It's the mental load, right? It's the, you know, who's doing the shopping and who's Mm -hmm. putting the chicken on when the kids get home and who's going to do the bath washing and who's, you know, all that stuff that, you know, is on the to-do list. That's all often in our heads um, that we don't necessarily articulate on the daily. So what they actually, and what the research suggested, particularly from the ABC podcast was it's actually an interesting activity. If you start jotting the, write a list, write a list of all of the things. Now that list could be 150 <laughs> like rows de- long, but um, my co-host Liv and also my best friend who joins us for a number of um, every sort of second or third episode, she did do that list. And she came onto the pod and she was like, girlfriend, I was ready to say, I do everything. I do 90% of the, the household activities and I worry about whose birthday presents have to be bought and bloody blah, blah. When she wrote the list down, she actually realized that the balance was a lot more even than she had initially thought. An example was, you know, well, I have to go do the supermarket shopping. And her husband said to her, yeah, but also you enjoy that. And I look at, I play with the children while you go off and do the supermarket shopping. So sometimes, you know, I notice that too at home. Well, I'm cleaning, but often it's my husband who is looking after the children. So he's not sort of just sitting on the couch and doing nothing, which is often what we can feel when we're in it with the activity that we're working through. Totally. And I've noticed that within myself that I have to be careful and pause and think, is this a story I'm telling myself that I'm doing everything and no one is helping me? Because when you actually pause, take a breath and look around exactly right, my I might be cooking dinner, mm. but my partner is, you know, looking after Poppy and entertaining her and making sure she's not running under my feet while I'm trying to cook. And that, yeah. 
you know, it, it is so, and I love that that is such a practical strategy to go, mm. all right, well, let's jot it down. But it also, I would say, probably important to jot it down and not discredit stuff that you might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal because I think we can do that as well. We can minimize or like lessen the load of a certain task. So yes. I think that really systematic of going through, it's not just, I don't know, dropping them off at daycare. It's like packing the daycare bag, making sure that their nappies are in there. Do yeah. they have their sleep sack? You know, all of that stuff kind of falls under the one job. 100%. And it's that's the thing, being as detailed as possible. And then where to from there? Okay, you've written your list. You may have realized that, hey, there is more of a balance or actually there's not as much of a balance as you had initially thought. And then the thinking around that is, okay, so of these tasks, what's feasible to potentially handball? Like, you know, could Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday lunches always be your partner. Um, perhaps, you know, they can handle that. You do Monday, Friday, just depending, you know, what's feasible. And I get it. At, at times it's not feasible to handball, you know, you know, much, but at least there's an opportunity to start having these conversations in your household because if you don't talk about it, that's when the resentment builds and that's when you'll explode down the track. So uh, it, uh, it's a fact-finding mission um, mm-hmm. is what they recommended in the research up front so you could have sort of more, you know, comprehensive conversations about where to from here. We had a funny one the other day where I had received e- emails from the MyGov app to say Poppy isn't up to date with her vaccines. You know, if you don't do it by this date, the childcare subsidy lapses, et cetera. And yeah. so I had that in the back of my mind, like, oh, got to do that, got to do that. And I was feeling myself get frustrated that I had this job to do. And then I realized I was like, well, I just haven't told Tristan that the job needs to be done. And yeah. I said to him, hey, if we don't have her vaccinated by this date, we're going to lose this subsidy and I just need you to take care of that job. And he just goes, cool, no worries. Yes. And yeah. then I had to park my, you know, I hate the term, but like mum guilt. He did it from completion. I didn't attend the vaccine and there was a part of me that was like, oh, you should be there for her. You know, she's having needles. But it's like, no, you've allocated that task. He is a loving parent. He's a safe place for her. You don't need to then involve yourself once you've offloaded that task. And it was just such a good reminder. Like I'd created this thing where I was like, oh, it's just another thing I have to do. And then as I said out loud, oh, hey, you know, we've got this message from my gov. He's like, yeah, all right, leave it with me. It's so true, isn't it? It actually, what comes to mind is just the other day. So on Friday, I have something on and it's school holidays at the moment, right? Friday morning, I've got something on um, and it's podcast related. And I have this a bit of a guilt around, okay, because I have my full-time job and podcast mm-hmm. is my passion. I was like, great, I need to look, uh, find somewhere for Noah, my four-year-old to go while I do the podcast thing. I'm calling half of Melbourne, like, <laughs> oh, you know, this place or this place or play centers and this and this. And it just to try and find somewhere for him to go. And then it, none of my plans were working out, nothing. And then I, I just turned to myself and I went, maybe I could just ask Jules if he might work from home that day. And like after reaching out to half of Melbourne, I reached out to him and he's like, yeah, that's sweet. I'll work from home. And I'm like, isn't it interesting the pressure that we can often put on ourselves? As you said, there might be a guilt piece around yeah. it. You know, there might be that, that ownership piece, like this is my responsibility, but also let's be fair to our partners and give them the opportunity to step in if they can. And with the podcast, I'm often speaking to couples and that's mm-hmm. what the dads are saying. The dads are saying, look, Often we're not really necessarily privy to a lot of these stresses and the more you can communicate them, the more we can operate as a team. Yeah. And are you finding with your work and among the research that there is just because of historical gender norms and social roles that it's hetero couples that are particularly challenged by this idea of the mental load? Yeah, there is. But interestingly, same-sex couples, often there they can be a similar dynamic. So mm-hmm. I even think about at, at the school, um, we've got a one of my friends, um, his name is Richard. He's fantastic. He's beautiful. And he'll often say like, he's the the mum, right? He's, mm-hmm. the, he's like, I'm the one that has to pack the lunches and blah, blah, blah. So, and because it also comes down to, I guess, incomes. And, you know, if someone is generally if they're earning more then the other person has to step up on the household front or you know yeah. often does step up so it, i think it's it, yes it is more balanced however there still is that sort of dynamic yeah and you make an interesting point there about taking into account income and who's doing the paid work and who's doing the unpaid labor at home 
how I think that is a really big challenge for a lot of families where they go, well, I don't want to bother my partner with that or I don't feel like I can. There's not a, a feeling of safety there to do that because they are already taking on the stress of financially supporting our family. Yeah. But I also think that that can be problematic when we're not, you know, we don't even feel like we can wake our partners overnight to help with a settle or a feed because this idea that they've got to go to work and it's like, well, you've got a day of unpaid work ahead of you too. This is a 24 hour gig. So how do you, what are your tips for families who who are kind of in that push pull of like one of you's doing the financial support, the other one's doing the home labor. What are your tips and strategies around that? Yeah, I mean, I can very much relate to that as well, where I was often home more with the children um, and hubby was out working. And what happened with me, even just from a personal standpoint, was resentment builds so much for me, particularly after we had our first and your whole life is spun on on its head. And mm-hmm. often you feel that, you know, your partner's life isn't as, you know, chaotic, for example, and it hasn't changed as much as yours. And so I think for a while there, I just like, you know, gripped my teeth and was like, this is my my role and I'm just going to have to suck it up because he's got to go off to work. But what I realized was if you are not communicating that, and it, it can be really difficult to communicate, as you said, if there's a bit of guilt associated with it and things like that, it can be. But if you don't, you end up where I ended up. So I just was chugging along, you know, probably eight months down the track after having my first and we were at a dinner party. So it's funny how resentment seeps out. Oh, so we're yeah. at a dinner party. Um, you know, I was, it's ne- nearly 12 o'clock. I had the babysitter. I'm thinking, okay, strategically, we'll get back before 12 because then the babysitter can knock off, bloody blah, blah, blah. Hubby's there sitting next to me going, oh, should we just have another wine before we go? And then one of the guys heard and was like, yeah, just have another wine. Yeah, mm-hmm. one more wine. And I, I sort of whispered to hubby, I'm like, yeah, but nearly 12 o'clock babysitter's coming, uh, you know. We'll You're already doing that mental labor. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, you know, and long story short, I had to give him the death stare and and we ended up leaving. We got back by 12, but then it all just exploded. I'm like, you don't understand. You're there willy nilly at the dinner party having your glass of wine. I'm thinking 12 o'clock nanny, da, 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 we've got this tomorrow. Da, da, da. And I'm like, this is me all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I have felt guilty to mention it because yes, you are working, but at the end of the day, this is so much on me. So it, it, it came out in probably more of an angry tone than what I would have liked. And so I guess the guidance around that is that was a great lesson for us because Actually, what we ended up doing after that was he still didn't quite get it. And we went off to see a relationship therapist and we had three sessions with her because we couldn't hear each other. You know, mm-hmm. um, although I love relationships and I and I love speaking to people about them and looking at the research and things like that, doesn't mean I'm perfect. And often we do need that, ex- that external support. So she gave us some tips like, you know, Yes, certainly don't have the serious conversations when you're both feeling heated. If you Mm -hmm. are feeling the resentment, make sure when you want to have that conversation, you're in the most sort of neutral kind of, you know, mindset rather than coming in attackingly because you're never going to be able to get your message out when you are feeling so angry. And even she said, write it down, write it down first around what are your resentments? Try to sort of, you know, figure out what's just the fluffy stuff, the story Mm -hmm. you're telling yourself and what are the things that, you know, it is fair to raise to your partner and perhaps there could be solutions that you could come up with together. So, you know, be strategic around the way you're thinking about these things, because if you just go blah, you might often not get the response that you're looking for. Yeah. And I think like what you've highlighted there with that one story, I feel like so many people could relate to, particularly mothers, because what happens in that scenario is you are well, you're kind of robbed of your opportunity to have fun, but you're also cast in this like fun police role. It's like, it's all, you know, I can see where you would have been in that situation where it's like, oh, it's also fine for you to lean in and be like, yeah, one more drink. But I'm over here like already 10 steps ahead to make sure that tomorrow is not a complete shit show. (laughs) And you can't see why that is also valuable and why I need you to meet me in this place. Something that I've found with us with the mental load is that it, it is not a set and forget. So you can't do this exercise of having these conversations and going, okay, cool. That's your job. That's your job. Family life is dynamic. We all have busy patches at work. We have, you know, sleep regressions, progressions, whatever you want to call them. We have sickness patches. And so everyone's needs and to-do list is always fluctuating. So I find that 
we now have a calendar, a shared calendar in the kitchen, not one on our phone. It's really visual. It's on the wall and anything key goes in there so we can kind of see where each other are at. And we have a family planner magnet on the fridge, which just says what everyone's got on that day. So like swimming lessons or whatever. And I think for us having those like really visual that in the kitchen has forced us to be constantly having a conversation and constantly reevaluating because Tris will go, oh, I can see that you've got workshops coming up for the next two weekends. And so he is already like, well, I'll take care of X, Y, Z. So I think that if as at a base level, if you're struggling, like get it out in the open and really start to visualize what each person's week looks like because maybe if you put down all of the things that you're doing for your kid like or kids you've got doctor's appointments on there you've got swimming you've got music class you've got to drop them off and it's all on the calendar in a certain color and you that color belongs to you you know it's always going to be top of mind for your partner to go oh you know I need to probably take on some of this load That's such a good one. Yes, I love that. We've got the Apple calendar where, you know, the green is the fam, the family, you know, items. Uh, But yeah, you're probably right because only the other day something got missed. Uh, So Jules had said, oh, we've got something on that Saturday. And I said, no, check the family calendar. (laughs) We've already got X, Y, Z on. And then we had the clash. So I think that's really powerful, perhaps having it, you know, physically old school. school, (laughs) And I take such pleasure on Sunday night of like filling in our meals and also I found that we meal plan now which is also a huge load off because I for me the mental load of decision making is frustrating I'm the naturally more decisive person of our dynamic I will wear that but having someone turn to you like every couple of days and going oh what are we going to do for dinner tomorrow oh Mm. do we need this it's just like my brain can't, uh, like, I don't need to take that on. So little things like lists on the fridge that are really out there for everyone to see so that you're not holding it all in your brain can really help with that division as well. Yeah, absolutely. I want to move us on to one of the other topics that got so many submissions, and this is intimacy or lack thereof. A lack of interest, just feeling touched out, a very large difference in libido, Um, And I know a lot of it is is interlinked with the mental load, but what is your experience in the, with the couples that you work with, particularly in parenthood around this topic? Yeah, it's interesting. And it's such a big one and so common. So for all of those out there who are feeling inconsistencies in libido and, you know, feeling touched out, you know, I've been there. So we've all been there, I believe at some point. So look, there are sort of two philosophies or theories. One is that if you are feeling touched out, just go for it anyway, i.e. show that level of intimacy or be intimate with your partner. And when you're in it, you might get your mojo back. That's one Mm -hmm. philosophy. Another is actually no, if you're not feeling you know, the desire to be intimate, then you, as an alternative, communicating that as much as you can to your partner. So I had a couple come on the show and they said, you know, they'd had that patch where, you know, he said, I just didn't feel loved. Like it was Mm -hmm. just a period where I was like, does she even care about me? I mean, all she's doing is, is worrying about this baby. And I get that. And I love this child, but like, what about me over here? And she said, um, the female was just like, look at, at that point, she was actually suffering from depression as well. Mm. And she said that the turnaround for me was actually when my husband turned to me and, and actually articulated, I just don't feel loved in this relationship, but what can I do? What can we do as a couple to sort of change things? Because the, I don't like the way that things are going. And she said it was almost like that slap in the face that she needed because she was so caught up in you know her own world. And, and what they did do was she just articulated, look, at the moment, I'm not feeling sexy. I'm not feeling like myself. And he said, what more can I do then to support? So, you know, he did bath time while he did bath time. She went for her walk and listened to a podcast or whatever she did. Often we can't give any more if we feel as though our cup is empty, which, you know, we we're all very aware of that, but how are you meant to feel sexy if you're, you just feel like you're giving and giving. So I wonder if, you know, and 
they often say the first place to start is, I mean, self-care is such a buzzword these yeah. days, but finding a little bit of time just to get back to feeling good in your own skin, communicating to your partner when you don't feel good in your own skin, and then sort of starting there as a starting point. I don't know, Beth, does that resonate with you? Totally. And I think that low libido, particularly for mothers, even outside of the physical stuff in postpartum, like, you know, you, you might be breastfeeding, your body feels different, you're recovering from birth in a physical sense. I think that from conversations I've had with friends and other mothers, it's more emblematic of you just feel disconnected to yourself. It's not even, you're not even thinking about your libido, but it's just a knock-on effect of I just feel disconnected from who I am and therefore I don't feel like I can connect with you in an intimate way because I just don't feel like myself. So when you do start to take back those small things and I want to recognize sometimes when people are like, you just got to get exercising again and you just got to do this, it's hard as a mother, especially a mother of a baby who potentially is up all night, you know, you're running on empty a lot of the time, but as you say, a walk around the block. So I used to, um, I went through a stage where Poppy was so from 3 PM, she would just whinge and it wasn't, she, it was just that, that little, like she wasn't verbal yet. She couldn't tell me what she wanted. She was tired. And it used to like, my nervous system would just, you know, that like, eh, eh, yeah. like I don't even want to do it into the mic, but it's not a cry. It's not yeah. a, a word. It's just this sucking. Mm. And I felt for her, but by the time my partner got home, I was like, I need to be away from her. I love her more than this world, but I cannot have her pulling out my clothes, just making that noise anymore. Mm. And I would have to leave the house and go for a walk and fresh air and call my sister or listen to a podcast. And it was often all I needed to come back into our family life and just be like, okay, it's all good. And then I reckon that my, I guess, threshold or interest in any form of intimacy, whether that's sitting on the couch or, you know, getting into bed together, but was higher just for that little piece of space away from them. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Just yeah. to be able to be like, catch us, oh, well, it's about me now for these 10 minutes or whatever that looks like. Definitely the place to start. Now, when you have found those nuggets of time where you can start feeling a little bit more like yourself and feeling a bit more sexy in your body and things like that, the other thing that we really recommend is, you know, where you can try and get a little bit of time away from, you know, your child, your children with your partner. Partner. It's really difficult. And I mean, I'm in a house with toddlers. You get it too, Beth. Like my husband and I barely get a word in with each mm. other when the kids are around. It's And so how are you meant to feel like you want to be intimate with them or build any sort of connection where you're just got food getting thrown at you and someone screaming because someone took their toy and blah, blah, blah. It's chaos. It's organized chaos. So often if you can get those nuggets of time, I mean, even to go for a walk together to, you know, God forbid, go for a dinner if you can, you know, yeah. these little things where you can start going, wow, like I remember what it was like when it was just the two of us and now we're connecting and and particularly for females, that connection piece emotionally is huge before we can then necessarily get to the more physical stuff, you know, mm -hmm. so connecting on that emotional level again, you know, doing the little things. If you are aware, for example, that, you you know, maybe your uh, partner is feeling a bit of a lack of affection and intimacy, it can be the smallest things that you can do to reach out and let them know that you're there. For example, even just the hand on the back as you walk past them, it could be the peck on the cheek as they leave and come in the door. It's these small things that often we dismiss and we're like, oh, don't, you know, who cares? Don't have time. But those little actions, you know, if you're very deliberate about them can sometimes make the difference as well as looking for those opportunities to connect emotionally. And then the physical, you know, will come from that. At mm -hmm. least that was, has been my experience. Yeah. And I think you've touched on something so nice there that sometimes we think about differences in libido and we're just like, oh, so annoying that they want sex. Yeah. <laughs> but we kind of maybe forget that maybe they're looking for reassurance. It's not always, I'm sure for some people, and definitely I don't want to discount anyone who's feeling like that is the issue in their relationship, yeah. but maybe it's, just as simple as giving them that cuddle on the couch when you finally get the baby down or giving them a kiss as they leave the house or whatever to just be like, I know that this, you know, we're not really us at the moment, but I'm still mm -hmm. here and we'll, you know, get back there. 
And something else I think if you're feeling it, if you're in the first year of parenthood, I don't know if this resonates with you, but be so kind to yourself. Like when you're in it, you think, oh, this is our forever now. And certainly I've had those thoughts of just like, oh, well, this is us, you know, just ships in the night. I think someone (laughs) wrote in roommate stage and I totally feel that. But it does pass. Like the intensity of the first year of a child's life eases in, in some ways. It doesn't it doesn't go away. Toddlers are crazy. But, <laughs> but that having the baby on you all the time, needing them to be in the carrier, if you're breastfeeding, settling them multiple times a night, that stuff slowly drops away and you can fill that space again with time with your partner, or at least that's been our experience. Like the first year, it just there was definitely patches where it was, you know, we're friends, <laughs> we love mm. each other. We're not being very intimate or close right now, but it does improve. Absolutely. And, you know, little things like maybe they go off to daycare, maybe you have that little bit more time just to having the time away. You might go back to work or, you know, if you are home working, doing initiatives that you love or reading a book and the more that you feel like you're back to a little bit more of your usual routine, certainly, mm. yeah, you've got that little bit more room to to give to someone else other than this little baby. I mean, for my first year, I had prenatal depression. It was a whirlwind. I just, and I had sorry, I had post and pre while I was pregnant. So probably for a good two years and for each child, I experienced the same thing. So I was not myself, but the things that pulled me out of it or the things that helped us maintain our connection were, you know, my partner was really insistent. He knows I love to go to restaurants. I love food. And so, you know, he would say when I was pregnant, well, we'll go down to the Thai place on, you know, even if it's once every three weeks and we'll book that in and off we go and have a little pat together and let's just re- use that as our reset. And we still use that as our reset now when we want to sort of reconnect. So finding the things that you love to do together, popping them in the diary and making time for them, I think is always sort of a good approach to take. Otherwise, life gets in the way and you're several years down the track and you're like, oh shit, how did we get here? You know, yeah. it, it is a job to some extent trying to reconnect as a couple. And I also had someone right in to say that it was very evident that they needed the support that you're referencing, but there was a level of resistance from their partner in seeking that support, in finding those strategies. Mm. That's such a tricky spot because it would feel like you're, you know, you're trying to come up for air and you're trying to bring them with you, but you're not quite getting there. You mentioned that you, you and your partner went to counselling Was there any conversation about like getting you both there? Were you both open to it? Do you have tips for people who are, for lack of a better word, trying to convince their partner to get some help as a couple? Yeah, it's interesting. I literally had this conversation with someone two days ago and it comes up a lot. Mm. So look, I was fortunate in my partner being quite open to seeking some, you know, third party's assistance. However, I literally just the other day I was speaking to a girlfriend about it and she said, I just know he won't go. He, mm. He's a, you know, this, I guess I, w- I won't even say a masculine, because, ma- you know, there's positive masculinity as yeah. well, but he's just very reserved, I guess, in the idea of, you know, showing his emotions around others. And so I said to her, okay, what is in your control then? What can we do for you? Would you consider perhaps going to see a a third party, getting some tips from them and then bringing those tips back into the household and seeing it, you know, sometimes it starts with yourself, right? And she just light bulb went off and she went, oh God, I didn't even think about that. I thought it was the two of us would have to go. And so, you know, and for years I saw a psychologist on my own as well. So I'm always into self-discovery. So I think, you know, if if your partner's not going to go, what things can you do to, to bring the support into the household? The other option is um, I've had my hubby listen to a couple of episodes of the pod where, you know, I'm like, oh, this is a good lesson and I've got a couple Mm -hmm. on and then the, you know, there's some lessons there. And so we'll be in the car on the way up to the beach or something and I'll be like, oh, let's listen to this podcast together, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Just the soft nudge. So, you know, little things like that too, Um, throwing resources at them in in a subtle way can also be helpful. I love that word nudge. Uh, It's like (laughs) it's, you know, nudge people towards where you need them to be. And I think as well, like something else, I imagine it would feel really scary for your partner to come and because the way that we see therapy unfold in movies and stuff, it's like the last resort. And I think statistically for a lot of people, it is. 
But I think if you reframed it and was just like, I want to do this because I love you and there's so much good stuff here and I really want to hold on to it rather than like we do, you know, that ultimatum, like, will we do it or, you know, I can't say what will happen yes. and just gently reframing it. And maybe it will be the combination of the reframing and the nudging of other resources and the demonstration of you working a willingness to work on yourself and admit flaws or whatever that you finally get there together. I think that is such a good one. And as you said that, I realized that the way I communicated it to Jules was, look, we're obviously, this is after the dinner party incident. I said we're obviously struggling struggling with understanding each other and I'm feeling not heard and you're feeling not heard. And I'm not saying we have to go to therapy for the next year, but hey, maybe we can go to two sessions, get a few Mm -hmm. tips that we can then implement. And he went, okay, so that's the other thing. Some people hear that and go, oh God, like how long are we going to have to do these sessions for, you know, it can be one, two, Mm. three sessions. You may just take the nuggets of wisdom and, and that's what we did and, you know, and use them accordingly. So I think, yeah, really thinking about and being intentional about how you communicate that, as you said, Beth, is a really good approach. Yeah. And we've touched on this idea of resentment and building up. And I think it feeds into so much what we've been talking about, Mm. but another theme that kept coming up is rage and definitely Definitely I can relate to this and it really shocked me. Mm. Probably it was relatively short lived, but definitely in the first sort of three or four months, I would have these patches of just like fury of, and I knew on a logical level that it was just, it wasn't anything that he was doing or not doing Yeah, because he was actually looking back like so wonderful, but it was just this coming to terms with my new reality that no matter how much preparation you do as a mother, and someone who's recovering from birth, whatever that looks like, there's just so much that changes. And I think it can manifest in like this, these feelings and thoughts of anger. Is that something you see come up in your work? Oh, absolutely. And that was, that was it for me. This is why for so long, I didn't actually realize I had postnatal uh, depression because I was just so damn angry. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. Oh no, depression is like when you're lying in bed and you can't get out of bed. Right. Like, I don't know. And you know, everything was just, you know, and, and it's, yeah, it's irrational rage. So I can certainly, um, relate to that. And I think this is where, uh, as I said, when we saw the therapist as well, um, some of the, the tips were never communicate when you're in that feeling of rage. Mm -hmm. Instead, let's try to have that feeling move on. You know, it comes, that's great. Accept it. Cause that was the other thing. I was like, why am I so messed up? I'm just trying to understand why I'm so angry. I know it's irrational and now I must be all messed up or something. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going around, you know, round and round in circles and I'm so frustrated and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, then I'll go on Instagram and compare myself to someone and be like, damn them and their life. And you you get in this web, right? So I think first and foremost, for me, I actually had to write down the things that I enjoyed enjoyed doing because I was so in my own head that I couldn't even remember what they were. And they were calling a friend, listening to a podcast, going for a walk, those sort of things. So I started implementing them as much as I could into my schedule. And, um, and then, you know, when I'd feel the rage come, I'm like, great, I need to shift gears. What can I do? And so I guess my biggest pointer around rage is, yeah, certainly doing the things that make you happy so that you can try to, you know, shift from that. However, when you are sitting in it, I would wouldn't recommend communicating Mm. to your partner, you know, um, in those moments, best for to let them pass and then perhaps looking for solutions around that too. Yeah. And I found that saying them out loud to Tristan, but not in an angry way, like when I was feeling a bit more settled and it would almost make me quite sad because I would say to him, like, I just, mine was stuff like, I'm angry that you can leave the house with nothing, like your pocket, you know, you've got your keys in your pocket. Yeah. And I'd be like, I see you do that and it makes me really angry. And I watch you fall asleep at night and I'm sleeping with one eye open because that's just my brain chemistry right now. The baby's next to me and it makes me so angry. And there was so many little versions of that. And because they were nothing that he was doing, we could talk about it like that because it wasn't like when you get home drunk at 10 p.m., that would be an issue. Whereas it was just like he can't it's not his fault that he falls asleep quickly. It's not his fault that he breathes loudly, (laughs) for example. But in those times, I was just like, oh my, how dare you? I'm over here doing my pelvic floor exercises. I've pushed it, you know, like, and you just start to spiral into all of this stuff. And I just found it really helpful and 
really useful for us to just be honest and say, because I'm not a very angry, I would say we don't have angry, ragey fights ever. So it was also good for him to hear because it's like, oh, that's not normal for you. So we can, it's good for us both to be aware of that. But I'd just be like, yeah, like I just see you leave the house every day and go to work and I just feel this frustration. And he's like, okay, fair enough. I hear you. And that was really good as well. So if you feel like you can communicate it productively, Mm. go for it. But I would agree with you when you're in it and you're just seeing like, you know, red flames in front of your eyes, it's not the time. No, a hundred percent. And I actually was speaking to a couple about this because it's such a common one, particularly your life is, my life is turned upside down. Yours doesn't seem to have as much. I'm angry mm. at you and the world. Um, and it was interesting. And this is why I, with the podcast, we try to get on couples because I love hearing the other person's perspective. Yeah. The dad said, well, actually I would leave for work every day and go, what am I going to miss today? Like, yeah. I, am I going to miss the first step? Am I going to miss that? You know, what am I going to miss? So often we are so caught up in the whirlwind that, you know, where they're trying to juggle it all. But isn't it interesting when you think about the other person's perspective and he's sitting there going, I can't wait to get home because, you know, I want to see, I don't want to miss anything when it comes mm. to this child. So sometimes reframing it as well can really help us too. Yeah. And it helped when I went, I mean, I was kind of dabbling with paid work all throughout, but when I actually went back to structured paid work, it was like this light bulb went off in my head. I got back from that first day of teaching a workshop all day and then stepped straight back into parenting because that's what you have to do. And I was like, I said to Tris, you've probably felt completely cooked and exhausted for months, haven't you? And he just looked at me and he goes, yeah, it's tiring. And I was like, it was really powerful because he got to see what my day all day intensive parenting was like that he maybe hadn't had as much of and obviously we don't all have the luxury of like having that split but we're kind of coming full circle talking about mental load but the more you can divide and really look at it will never be equal but we can really step into each other's shoes the more you might realize you're more of a team than you think absolutely and I think that's such a valid point what you said there it will never be equal and that resentment piece for me. I was so angry because I was like, it has to be 50, 50. Like I work too. I've got things to do, you know? And I think the, the way I was able to start shedding some of that resentment was realizing it's never going to be Mm -hmm. 50, 50. And I need to be okay with that. And And I know that I will generally do more during the week in the household. And I think sometimes just owning that can be a great place to start too, because I was resisting that for so long and it was just tearing me up. So I think it's a valid point, you know, it may never be 50-50 in your household. For sure. And yeah, you can hold on to it or you can choose to let go and also just maybe letting go of you might get closer to 50-50, but things might not be done to the certain standard or the way that you would do them. And that's something we have to let go of as well. And not to say that it's okay if they half, you know, half do a job. That's so yeah. annoying. Mm-hmm. But like we are constantly having conversations about mess, clutter, la, la, la. And it's just like at the end of the day, that's family life. We all live in this house and it's actually a me problem. I don't like things everywhere, but you know, no one else is bothered. Yes. <laughs> Pillows are on the floor and the basket of toys wasn't picked up, you know, as soon as they weren't in use anymore and that the yeah. towel wasn't hung up straight. It's like you kind of, well, I, for me anyway, I've had to also do some introspection and be like, that stuff stresses you out. It actually doesn't change the functioning of the household. It's not, yes. um, you know, it's not a sink full of dishes. That's different. It's just evidence that we all live here and it's yes. messy and so on. So, yeah, I think picking your battles and knowing where to hold on and where to let go is what I've really tried to do. Yeah, spot on. I totally agree. So I think we've worked through a lot of the key topics, but one more that I do just want to hear your thoughts about before we wrap up is this idea of what do you do when you and your partner have different parenting styles? Do you merge them? Do you let go of one? What, you know, especially I had a few questions around different approaches to sleep, you know, co-sleeping and affection or wanting to sleep train or, you know, it's so complex. But have you had experience with that where parents are going, what does this look like for us? Because we don't agree. Yeah, it's such a hard one as well, isn't it? So look, 
I mean, often, and one of the pieces of advice that I received um, from a therapist when I was pregnant for the first time and I was struggling was she said, have a think about the type of parents that you guys want to be, you know, and write down some of the non-negotiables, I guess, around, the, you know, some of the decisions that you're going to make for this child. Now, uh, we did do some of those things and look, for those of you who are in it at the moment, sitting there thinking, okay, well, where to from here? Coming together to try and, you know, have the discussion around being a united front around some of these topics is a great place to start. So for example, you know, on the discipline front, you might sit down when you have your 10 minute work with your partner, if you're lucky enough to go for a walk for 10 minutes without the child, or even while baby's, you know, sleeping in the pram and the two of you are together, yes. you know, have a chat about, okay, so when this baby, or if you've got the toddlers, when they play up, what are we going to do? Are we doing timeout? Are we doing, talk to me about your feelings? Are we, do, you know, sort of trying to get on the same page before you're in the chaos is mm -hmm. often a great place to start. With sleep, I think we got to a point where we ended up sleep training. Um, we went to Masada Sleep School. Mm -hmm. We were both so deliriously tired that that was kind of, we were like, we're going to go with any option. So sometimes you're forced in a direction that you may have originally had a difference of opinion on, but you get there and you're like, mate, I've got to sleep. I'm gonna, you, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And off you go. So, but I guess I think that's a great place to start if you can, before you're having to make these swift decisions around, you know, discipline when you're in it and the kids just stuffed up and you both look at each other and it's like, well, I I want time out and, you know, your partner's like, well, hold on, I don't agree with that. And the kid's screaming and you're trying to make decisions. It, it becomes very, you know, it can be confrontational in those moments. You know, are there things you can be talking about up front mm. prior, right? I love everything that you've just shared because – I feel like before the before they become toddlers, it's less parenting and more caring. This is my experience anyway. It's yeah. it's intensive of caring for the baby, making sure their needs are met. But in terms of that behavioral stuff, you're not there yet. And then suddenly they're one and a half, and you're like, oh, I have to parent you, or you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna be a troll running around the house. <laughs> like I have to do something here. And yeah. so that we are kind of in the thick of feeling out our true parenting style and yeah. something that I take a lot of comfort in is that we get to decide. So we get to take on what worked or what we valued from our childhoods or what we, we thought, you know, maybe take it or leave it or, or some things that have changed over time. And the one big thing, I don't really mind, like we're both we're pretty different people, me and my husband, but where our values are very much the same. But my big thing will always be consistency and being a united front because I don't think it's ever helpful for you and your relationship to feel like your kids have the ability to play you off against each other. And if one of you is saying one thing and then going, oh, well, mummy said this or daddy said that or whatever, I feel like that is where I would personally feel a lot of resentment because I know that we would naturally slip into like someone's the fun one and someone's not. And I think that would be the hard bit beyond even the parenting decision that you've made, if that makes yeah. sense. So our conversations are a lot more about like, what do we want to do? Let's have this conversation away from Poppy, not in the moment in front of her. And then let's try and be supportive of one another and be consistent. So if you, if I see Tristan be like, no, the TV is going off. I don't then go and turn it on half an hour later when he's not looking. Because yeah. even if I'm like, oh, I just needed 10 more minutes while she was watching the noodles. <laughs> Why yeah. did you turn that off? I'm like, that's a decision that's been made. And you're yeah. my partner and my, my teammate in this moment. And I have to support you. And I would hope that you would do the same. Yes. So. Yeah. And I also had a really beautiful tip once that if you were to write down and you might've done this in your processes, but if you were to write down what your goals and hopes are for your home life or for your child's experience, you'd probably write the same things to feel loved, to be safe. You might go about it differently, but your hopes for their experience of being parented are the same. Yes. And so that can be really powerful too. I think if you're just, if you feel like you're really at odds break it down and be like, well, are we at odds or are we just going about this at really different ways? Yeah, love that. No, that's fantastic. And even just uh, an extension of that is, you know, if you have found that you're, you know, having an argument or, or a difference of opinion in front of the children, there's a way to sort of be productive about that to some extent. But if you're finding it's not being overly productive, again, just parking it, like you oh, said, yeah. and so 
way, coming back to it, which is a really difficult thing at times when you want to get your message across. But that is something that we've tried to implement too, because yeah, we want to appear as much as possible as a united front in front of this little one. And um, we're never going to be perfect, but it's just a little (laughs) to bear in mind, right? As you go about your day. um, Yeah, it's always a good place to start. Yeah. I honestly could talk to you about this stuff all day, but I am very conscious of your time. So I'm going to wrap up by doing something that I've been doing with the beautiful growing guests lately. And I ask in advance a question, just saying if a new mom came to you and shared that she was feeling lost, what would you say to her? And you very beautifully said, we all feel lost and you're not alone. There's no manual for this. It is the most fulfilling yet challenging experience but speak to friends, people in your community, listen to podcasts and seek out resources so that you feel less alone. And I just think that's the most beautiful note to end on that we shouldn't be navigating this feeling like we're the only ones because we're certainly not. Yeah, love that. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time, Leonie, and thank you for letting us walk around your brain for a little bit. (laughs) Thanks so much, Beth. If you're hearing this message, then you've listened all the way to the end and maybe you're keen for more. If that's the case, jump over to my website to learn about how I can support you in pregnancy. It's www.birthwithbeth.com.au or check out my Instagram for heaps more educational content. Thank you for being here and I'll see you back here very soon.